So uh, welcome along, everybody, uh, to our um, small but elite group. Uh, we, um, uh, you may have noticed I've been on the train a lot in the last couple of days, and I've noticed all these ads for um, for apps for job seekers. You may have noticed them yourself. Um, now, what these job hunting apps have done technically is make it easier to find work, but they also have exposed women to one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with male employees, uh, and that puts them at risk of harassment and assault. And business and universities have been alarmed by a steep rise in uh, sexual assaults against women during job searches. Uh, the problem uh, made the headlines uh, six months ago uh, when an employee from a major trading house was uh, arrested on suspicion of raping a job hunting student after he plied her with drink. Uh, the Labour Ministry in October uh, issued basic guidelines for companies to prevent power harassment uh, in the workplaces, but uh, our speakers here today are here to um, uh, to explain why those guidelines are inadequate. So we have, uh, I'll read out them as they have them on the page here, we have Professor Mari Miura, uh, of, sorry, uh, maybe I'll go first with Kauri Sensei. Uh, Mari, Mari will go first, yeah. So, um, Mari Miura of Sophie University, she's a, a, a regular to this club, she's spoken many times over the years. Uh, Professor Kari Hayashi of the University of Tokyo. And uh, we have two students, that's Ria Endo and Chisato Yamashita. They're both with International Christian University. Uh, I think they're a little bit nervous about speaking, so be, go easy on them, be gentle <laughs> on them. Uh, we are going to have um, Miura Sensei talking first. And then we will have Hayashi Sensei. They're just going to introduce the topic, and then we'll have the two students. Just uh, kind of remind you, if you haven't already, uh, to switch off your mobile phones uh, so we don't disturb the speakers when we start. Thank you very much. Tozo. Well, thank you, David, for having such a great op uh, opportunity for us to give a talk today. And thank you, everyone, uh, uh, to come here this afternoon. Uh, this is such a, a great, a precious opportunity uh, for us to voice up about uh, the sexual harassment issued in public in Japan. And it is very meaningful for us to welcome international media to put more spotlight on sexist issues in Japan because it's extremely difficult uh, to change the situation only from within. And we are representative uh, members from a network called SAY, S-A-Y, Safe Campus Youth Network. It is very uh, new, relatively new network uh, launched by Professor Kaori Hayashi and also me uh, to uh, talk about and discuss uh, gender activists, especially on campus with students. So um, this say includes a student groups from six universities in Tokyo area and also uh, faculty members of various universities. And we meet uh, basically once a month and study uh, sexism on campus and how to prevent such sexism and also gender-based violence. And we learned that there are lots of preventative uh, measures have been taken in the uh, United States or other universities uh, outside of Japan. So we are basically learning uh, what can be done on campus. And then uh, uh, on one of those regular meetings, we learned that a Ministry of Labor issued uh, draft guidelines to prevent harassment in the, work of, in the world of work, and they mentioned uh, harassment against uh, job-seeking students, but we found it very inadequate. So we decided to issue a statement, uh, which uh, we translated into English and we distributed it to you, so we probably have it on, in front of you, a statement demanding implementation effective measures to prevent sexual harassment in job hunting. So we provide some information about uh, the realities of uh, sexual harassment against job seeking students, and also we talk about the structural progress behind uh, sexual harassment. And we also call for specific demands to Ministry of Labor uh, and also uh, companies and universities. So, so this, th that is why we, we decided to have this pre conference to discuss and explain uh, the statement, also other students' actual voices uh, behind uh, our issue of this uh, statement. So Professor Hayashi is gonna explain about more about our uh, conference. So because we want to uh, make this problem, in, uh, talk about this problem in the public, 
Today we have two courageous students here, and they will explain the problem of sexual harassment during the so-called shukatsu, or job hunting in Japan for university students. And please understand that these students, speaking up in front of the camera, can adversely impact their prospect of future job interviews and careers. It is extremely challenging for students in Japan to publicly problematize this issue because potential employers exercise enormous power over them. Nevertheless, these students have come forward today because they want people from all over the world to pay attention to this sexually abusive practice in this country. They are going to explain to you why they are doing so. And let me briefly define the shukatsu sekuhara, or harassment during the so-called shukatsu, or job hunting in Japan. Uh, sexual harassment during job hunting is to be mentally, psychologically, physically, or financially abused, insulted, hurt, neglected, or negatively impacted in such a way that the victim is denied their identity, ideology, or right during any point of the process of job hunting, including internships and training periods. So uh, now we, we would like to uh, introduce these two students. Uh, Chisato will now explain to you what she has experienced and what she has to say about this problem. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Chisato Yamashita, and I'm a feminist activist. And today I'm sitting here as a feminist activist, and I'm also like one of the member of um, say community has uh, which has been holding the study session. But more importantly, we ke came here to rebuild the sexism in Japan, and we're sitting here as women, as student, as activists and as a nation who are living in this liberal democracy system, and we really, we really appreciate this opportunity in order to change that, because we really need the support from all, all over the world, and I want, I want any, anyone to support our, acti um, um, our activity as feminists, because it's really extremely hard to be feminist in Japan, and there are tremendous, huge amount of backlash in Japan here. Um, before moving on to my main point, I'm going to be explaining um, the, we are from um, SEI, but also at the same time we're members of Voice of Japan. And Voice of Japan is an organization launched by Kazuna Yamamoto, who spoke up about women object objectification issues published by Japanese sexual tabloid magazine. And I think, I think, I think you may know about the, do you, do you, are you aware of this? Thank well, you. Just, um, for, right. just for people who aren't mm -hmm. aware, it was Spa Magazine, wasn't it? Which yeah, right. a year ago, uh, or so, over a year ago, yeah. published a yeah. ranking of female of universities according to the sexual availability of female students. Mm -hmm. And you, as I understand it, the protests had that issue taken down, so they succeeded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we're from our International Christian University, so-called ICU um, branch, and that is the branch in ICU campus, which is attempting to make the university campus safer and open to more diverse students. And um, it is, again, um, it is very important that foreign media broadcast the situation of Japan as this Japanese sexist system has been deeply rooted in this society. And there's social pressures, there's a huge amount of social pressures which do not allow media to make um, sexual issues um, sensational. Foreign broadcasting would definitely help to create criticism toward Japan and this um, social structure holds um, whole attitude and it has more potential for the whole Japanese political system to face sexual issues more seriously and critically. Um, and before moving on to my point, uh, we are, I want to clarify that we're students who are not willing to do this type of this job hunting system in Japan, that's, 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 that allow us to stand here and sit here and talk about this because as she explained, it's really hard for the victims or actual students to voice up. And so there's no much possibility that being of us being the direct victim of this sexual harassment during job hunting. However, we live in a very sexist country as, and we are the victim and we are always being exposed to this gender um, discrimination in Japan and um, socially, politically, and economically struct, um, structured. 
And we believe that it is natural to voice up about this issue as women and students, as feminist activists. It's kind of redundant, I'm sorry. Uh, but we really want to reflect the voice of vulnerable in the society. And furthermore, we're just sophomore students. and. F um, but some of our friends have already been the victim of sexual harassment during job hunting. That's why, and also that is um, w one of the reasons why we're demanding to take specific and more convincing actions to the government, companies, and university who have never done enough to prevent no more harassment, especially job hunting, and in any sexism issues. We're not satisfied at all about this um, Japanese whole society sense to sexual issues. Um, I'm, um, I will be talking about what is going on within the job hunting. Um, according to the survey conducted by Business Insider Japan in February, in February, nearly half of all of job hunting students have experienced sexual harassment. This is huge. And article issues by them in November included, uh, included a testimony that wrote, um, I'm going to be explaining like a lot of devastating stories from the victims and who gave us gave the voice of Japan uh, their voices. And I was invited to an employee's house with an excuse that he would show me his notes that he kept during job hunting. And I was forced to drink a large amount of alcohol. I was not fully conscious. He touched my body and graded it, made many comments that denied my dignity. I could not really do my job hunting anymore because of this incident of sexual harassment. And there are tons of more. Um, an, employee, an employee that I met through job hunting up invited me for dinner and touched my body inappropriately. And he asked my address several times, saying that he would check and crack my entry seat at my house. And other it's saying, when I was sitting, an employee tried to look inside my shirt from above during especially internships. And the other is saying, I was forced into a sexual relationship with the, with the woman in charge of human affairs. So there is a male um, victim too. It was my first choice company, so I reluctantly agreed. Female students are particularly susceptible to harassment dur during interviews. When the interviewers ask whether they're going to get married and have children, or whether they have older boyfriend, because having older boyfriend gives more um, potential that girls will marry early, and um, the companies would waste their money to like funding those students. <laughs> and, on uh, one of the victims of the speaker in this, we actually had the Japanese con um, press conference in this morning, and at the time we had one of the students who spoke as victim, and she told me that her feeling, she has been doing the job hunting for like one year, which is really long, and she feels that over 80% of the company's employees have asked her whether she has boyfriend or whether what kind of plan you have after like for like in terms of marriage or like raising children and um this we believe that this is a reflection of heavily gender biased patriarchal um, <coughs> social roles enforced on and internalized among men and women. So it's even hard for women to realize in what kind of situation they're placed in society. And it's really hard for them to question the whole society system because the, uh, Japanese education is just teaching them to not question the power, not question the authority. So it's really hard to like question the status quo in the first place for them. So I'm going to be explaining what is job hunting like in Japan. And I'm, after that, I'm going to be talking how it is actually getting changes and it is making more black box for students. First, what is job hunting in, in Japan? Job hunting or job seeking, which is called shukatsu in Japanese, starts early on for students, mainly their junior year, as they, started to, they start to attend seniors and workshops. It's not uncommon that some of the students started to worry about building their stable career from freshman year. 
and the Keidanlan, which is the Japanese Business feder Federation, decides every year the recruitment schedule. They have really strong power in Japan. And after or just before entering senior year, students start applying for companies by handing in so-called entry seats or application essays, consider a vital step in job hunting. U university hold workshop for writing entry seats and many students use al 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 alumni, alumni visits to have their essays checked. They then go through interviews and group discussions until they win naite, which is job offers in Japanese, and of post-graduation employment, and start working in April. In Japan, the status, quo, the status of being new graduate is considered very important in looking for a job because many companies mostly employ only new graduate or at least within one to two years of graduating. This is also a reflection of how Japanese culture uh, values the youth and being young, like in terms of age, rather than how much, cap um, how much ability they have or how, what they can do. And especially women are the victim of this all the time. Women are expected to be young and look young and stay young. Or, um, that is um, sexism is all, is is Japan in in Japan. And if students do not work immediately after graduation, it often ruins their promising career path. And there's um, there's strong stereotype towards those people who didn't start work immediately, start working immediately, and they they received a lot of pressure from family and friends and society. In short, job hunting is a significant activity that influences our society, whose live lives as a student. And I'm going to be talking how it is actually getting changes and it's um, getting harder for students to real, um, um, get out of this system. Um, K Downland, the business of the, um, the business um, federation, recently removed the recruitment guidelines and popular, popularizing of the internet and job hunting apps complicated this recruitment process because any anyone can access to any student through internet without the intervene of the companies so it is getting com more complicated and there are now multiple means of job hunting such as a visit to the potential employers by using those job hunting apps and it's this its system is actually an almost exactly like dating apps in general, and their apps on, um so and also like most of the employees who have signed up for those kind of apps are male, and they're not um sh they're not actually showing their real name. They are showing their face, but we can't really tell whether that's the real picture or not. And um, those, um, a lot of them write this like life lesson or goals, which makes it harder for students to make judgment whether they are good or bad. And there are actually um, apps which only female students can sign up. So we really think that um, some of them are targeting to and intended to like meet female students. And internship hiring uh, um, is, has been really common these days, um, which is recruitment through internships. And we, um, the referral hiring um, has been also, um, and also alumni, alumni visits and recruitment system, where younger employees recruit students. So not the HR who is in charge of choosing people and, and choosing um, employees, but just um, fresh workers who has been working for only like two to three years. And um, uh, one of the victims from this morning told me that um, you have been working at one company for like two years. And just because um, the same, um, someone from the same university that you came from, you are asked to do their interviews. So we are saying that they're not trained to know and be aware what is sexual harassment or what is harassment in general. And um, yeah, and this means that job hunting includes a wide range of means other than job interviews. Therefore, uh, the actual job hunting period has been very long and intimate, intimate because how much they're intimate or how much they the, how much the individual's employees think they're good enough to be in this company has 
has become more important criteria to judge who they should put into their companies. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, why um, sexual harassment actually happens here. Um, the employees of the companies are aware how much desperately college students want to find a job because they, they have been through the same system and they have been through the same social pressure that they have to get job immediately. So they know the pressure. And many students believe that these employees have the authority to make decision who the company can hire. And some of them actually have power. And some of them pretend that they have power and or the connections, which is sucks. And there, were, there was one case that one guy called himself that he's in charge of hiring um, employees. And um, after the rape incident happened, she found out that um, he, he already quitted that company and he left and he launched his own business. So which, so students are so blind and it's really hard to make judgment whether they actually in employers or whether actually they have the power to employ that student. And um, employees can take advantage and they do take advantage of that power relationship and make it look as they have the power to sexually harass the students, including sexually assaulting them and raping cases. Okay, so hi, I'm Riando. I'm also from Voice of Japan. Um, I would like to start by sort of sharing my thoughts with you. Um, I find it, as just as I said, I find it unacceptable that one person's lighthearted actions and words can destroy a person's, a student's future. And these are students with dreams and careers in mind. And the patriarchal heteronormative system is so deeply rooted in society and in the job hunting culture that people don't realize they are enforcing uh, social gender roles uh, and violating the human rights of students who haven't even started working yet. For example, it's extremely dis um, disturbing that female students are asked if they're going to get married. Um, that's why even the brightest and most motivated female students um, are assumed to be appropriate for or even wanting um, clerical positions, which have close to zero uh, chance of promotion. Um, in contrast to um, general career track positions that are heavily male-centered, and men vice versa. Um, eager, capable students are more blindly affected and feel shattered by such comments of sexual harassment. Um, some suffer from depression and suicidal thoughts. Um, and this enforcement of gender roles oppresses sexual minorities as well, who may not fit into um, these bias expectations. And what's worse is that um, these cases are almost never reported, and employees don't hesitate to say anything. Um, like, they can say anything they like because students are the weak ones um, in that um, power relation, and they're forced to laugh it off. And if they speak up or report this harassment, they might be seen as troublesome, mm. and they might not get the job. Or if they find it unbearable, they might just give up job hunting um, altogether. So, um, because that's how oppressive and unbearable sexual harassment is when it comes from someone in a position of power. And people suffer in silence, and offenders aren't punished. And then the next generation of students, um, our friends and our families, your children and grandchildren, are in danger of going through the same thing. So this is everyone's problem and everyone's responsibility. Um, so Giovanni students, as I just mentioned, um, they're considered potential subordinates. And they're very sensitive to evaluation by potential employees, employers. And filing complaints um, may adversely affect their job hunting, so it's um, difficult to them for, to resist and even express a sense of displeasure. This is because the power balance between the students and employers is very unequal. And if the current situation continues, students will have um, no choice but to endure this harassment. And so they're caught in the gap between the law and the universities and companies. And they have close to no legal rights because um, job hunting students are not legally workers um, employed by companies under Japanese labor law. So they 
are not eligible to be protected by the law. And for that reason, most students who experience harassment cannot even seek advice or take legal action. Um, the ILO Convention on Violence and Harassment includes job seekers and job applicants um, in their definition of workers, um, which provides them with legal protection. So this demonstrates how narrow the, the range of um, application of the labor law that protects workers is in Japan. And um, Article 5 of the Equal Employment Opportunity Law in Japan states that with regard to recruitment and employment of workers, employers shall provide equal opportunities for all persons regardless of sex. The current state of job hunting students, especially female students, um, experiencing sexual harassment indicates that the aim of the Equal Employment Opportunity Law is being ignored or being downplayed. To change the current situation of job hunting students having to give up the future because of sexual harassment, it is necessary to put in place a seamless system to protect the rights of job hunting students so that they don't fall into the gaps in the law. We need public consultation services and relief systems um, for, victim, for victims and mandatory education and training companies to prevent harassment and the introduction of regulations. Um, for example, punishment not only to the perpetrators but also to the companies who employ them. Um, we ask companies to take socially responsible actions um, for, the for the sustainable development of society. Um, they must be held accountable to society um, and nurture and protect young people who will lead the future and who will produce profit for that company. Um, it is unacceptable that young people are not able to work in the desired path or even to work due to sexual harassment. And so practicing corporate social responsibility is beneficial to corporations as well as to the general public. Um, in addition, the lack of support systems and information sharing about such support for job hunting students um, by universities is a serious problem. Um, it is an educational institution's obligation and duty to create an environment where students can concentrate on their studies and provide appropriate guidance on pursuing their careers. In recent years, universities have actively added internships to the curriculum and have outsourced career education to companies. Under these circumstances, universities must establish support systems that students can use to report sexual harassment and get much, need, much needed help. And um, we also urge them to conduct surveys to acknowledge the prevalence of this issue rather than wait for victims to speak up, which is um, what the universities are currently doing. Universities must show companies that they will not tolerate sexual harassment. And no one should be forced or persuaded to tolerate sexual harassment anymore um, in the job hunting culture. Well, thank you very much uh, for everybody for speaking. Just on a point of clarity, um, you said in your handout that 50% of job hunting students have experienced sexual harassment during job hunting. Assume, I assume that means male and female students. It's not just female students, right? Oh okay. yeah, it's not just female, but most of them are Most female. of them are female, yeah. okay. Um, well, we will open the floor up to questions uh, from the working press first and then to the whole room. Uh, if anybody has a question for the group, could you uh, put up your hand, indicate who you are, and uh, when you come to the mic, if you could um, tell us who you are and who you work for, that would be great. Um, I'll, unless, uh, you have, okay, Dozo, I have a question, but I'll keep my powder dry for now. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bobby van der List. I'm a freelance journalist. Um, well, thank you for coming uh, to the FCCGA to speak out. That's very brave, so. It's very our pleasure, thank you. Thank you. Um, I actually have a question for uh, Muda-san. Yeah. Um, as you work for university, mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing, like, or I, I just want to know what, what do you think is the responsibility of uh, universities to sort of protect mm -hmm. uh, their students while mm -hmm. job hunting? Mm -hmm. Because you, you would say they have quite a bit of bargaining power. Uh, companies need their students. Uh, so are, are, do you think they use this sort of bargaining power mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. well, change or ask companies to uh, punish uh, mm -hmm. uh, pe people that uh, violate the law. Mm. So, yeah. Right. 
Uh, I, I cannot really speak on behalf of universities, but my understanding is that universities do not think that they have bargaining power vis a big companies. And as they said, there's such a huge social pressure exists that uh, students have to find a job before graduation. Uh, and that also goes to the university's reputation. And usually universities uh, disclose uh, the percentage of students who already uh, acquire a job before graduation, upon the graduation. So universities do care about those uh, rates of job uh, hunting. So therefore, universities do not think that they have bargaining power. Uh, but on the other hand, universities obviously have responsibility to protect their students. And those harassment are taking place while they are still students. So obviously uh, universities do have responsibility, but not many students actually come forward to universities to get help. And students think that that's really outside of education. This is really between students and companies. So therefore, students do not think that you know, they are protect, or they should be protected by universities. So there are only a few cases that students actually consult a harassment helpline set up at universities. And my university or some other university, they don't really get any concrete case of uh, job hunting harassment yet. So therefore, they don't think that they have to take action. Mm -hmm. And this shukatsu, or job hunting sexual harassment, have been reported uh, since around February this year. So now university realized that this problem exists. So now they rea just realized that problem. But, and of course they have to make some measures to prevent sexual harassment during job hunting, but they just don't know the first hand information from their students, so therefore their mood is still slow. So me or, or Professor Hayashi or many other uh, faculty members try to put pressure to our, you know, uh, our universities and they raise awareness about the problems. That's that's current stage. Thank you. Oh, I actually ha want to add some things to the um, what she has said, and um, it just uh, when I went to my university and when I went. Um, I talked. I talked to them whether, like, as a student, not as a fac activist, but I asked them how would they protect me if I become the victim of sexual harassment during job hunting, and what they told me is that um, there is no precedent reporting or any like punishment for the those sexual harassment. So they can't really tell what they're gonna do. And at the time, I asked them what they have done, and they have. They haven't really done anything because there is no report from students, and that that is because they're not actively working on revealing it. They're just they they ask like some question C's to um the students who have been going through this um job hunting process, but they just add this like like as a last question, they just add small box to ask, did you have any troubles like during job hunting? And this, uh, we think that this is not actively um, trying to reveal this situation. So that that's the university stance that I think it's too big deal for them to like work on this because they need to take a lot of action to persuade um, um, government and the companies and this cadre and federation system. So I think it's just, uh, that's, that's I think one of the reasons why. And also just in general, like Japanese university, most of, I mean, mostly not this um, university has been actively working on to eradicate the campus lab or sexual, like spreading the idea of con sexual consent. And mostly like no, no university um, provides like public, um, mandatory gender education to students. So um, I think just like university system in general are not aware of this like the whole sexual issues. So that's that obviously do not much doesn't motivate them to work on this like um, sexual harassment, this specific issues either. That's the reality I think. Thank you. Thank you. Harash Sensei, did you want to say something or Well, I have actually nothing to add. All right. Uh, Linda?
Linda Sieg from Reuters. Thank you all for coming today. I'd just like to um, check a couple of facts. Uh, one is uh, Yamashita-san and uh, Endo-san, you are both sophomores, and how old are you? But more importantly, <laughs> what I'd like to know is, uh, have you presented this demand uh, to the Labor Ministry? Uh, did, would, did you do that today? No, no, no. no. Not yet. We are you just planning to do that? No, we just put on the web. But we didn't uh, actually hang it, hand it to uh, the ministry yet. And we're going to hand this to Ministry of Education later today. Later today, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, who at the ministry? What level? Mi ministry of Education. We don't know yet. You don't know yet? Mm -hmm. Okay, but later today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, you don't know the reaction? Yet. No, not yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you spoken to any uh, members of parliament, for example? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any support from mm -hmm. politicians? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, some yeah. politicians. Mm -hmm. Such as? Oh, okay, okay. Oh, uh, Fukushima Mizuho from uh -huh. uh, Social uh, Democratic yes. Party yeah. and also Yoshiko Kira from Communist Party. And yeah, those uh, actually questioned uh, those guidelines, um, the draft during the parliamentary session. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But not from the parties that is dominating the. Right. Okay. Yeah. So just you'll be presenting it later today. To the Ministry of Education, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions mm -hmm. on the floor? Oh, sorry. Your, right. age your age? Um, 19. 20. <laughs> 19. Yes. Those are correct. <laughs> it's a small group, so <laughs> we can be free with free questions. No, Start with one. Mm. Yeah, my name is Kutsi, but I'm an associate member first. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy to mm -hmm. see uh, Professor Mura mm -hmm. coming here mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. She was giving us a fantastic presentation mm -hmm. in February mm -hmm. about gender equality, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. we hope to mm -hmm. see you again. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. actually, I met uh, Professor Hayashi by chance last week at the, at the German uh, Institute. <laughs> and I didn't think that we would see you so quickly at the Foreign Correspondence Club, and we really hope that you will come again. Uh, my question is, this is a, it's a little bit delicate, but uh, we, we have been talking now about sexual harassment uh, and uh, uh, you mentioned that um, the young employees who did these interviews did not really know what sexual harassment means. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, just by common sense, I would say there is a, a very wide range of what is, uh, um, well, considered to be the sexual harassment uh, on the on the on the worst side we all agree that rape obviously that's uh, uh, well which is a real not only sexual harassment it's a real crime uh, where is where does it start where from i mean it's a very delicate mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to make a judgment, but uh, where does he sexual harassment, where can it be, uh, I would guess it would start as verbal mm -hmm. uh, and so on, but um, could you p perhaps elaborate a little mm -hmm. bit more in detail about that? Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. So could you elaborate uh, what you mean by, especially verbal sexual harassment? Of course we know that, and what it touching that's sexual harass harassment, obviously. But in terms of verbal harassment, how, could you take some examples? Uh, and the, you already took examples, but mm -hmm. uh, could you uh, rephrase some of the verbal expression which you think that's harassment? And oh, yeah. could you ex elaborate why you think that uh, can be considered as sexual harassment? So some of the harassments uh, that we collected are like uh, employees ask, uh, uh, do you have boyfriends? Or um, what kind of sexual relationship do you have? Um, right? Yeah. And that's, that's usually, employees seem to consider this is an icebreak conversation. Hmm. <laughs> 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 to make 
kind of friendly. They think, so they think, don't think this is harassment. They think it's a friendly icebreak conversation. But students took it very differently. They think there's a huge social pressure, and they feel that they have to uh, disclose those very private, personal uh, you know, relationship. So just to blur the lines a little bit, what if an employer asks you about your marital status, which if your employer asks you if you're married, uh, you know, uh, uh, genuinely sort of inquiring whether you're going to be available for work at all times, or whether you have children, is that considered harassment as well? Do you think that will? I think so. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, um, asking a female student if um, she has a husband, um, sort of assumes that that female student is heterosexual in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and it also, it can deny that female student's sexual freedom because um, it might be taken to mean that that student um, is going to quit their job when they get, um, if they're married. Um, they are um, more likely to quit their job. That's what the employer might assume, and then they might not decide to hire her because um, she will not produce um, sufficient profit for the company. So I think that is a form of sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I think so. Yeah, I agree with her. Oh, yeah, and also like they're just targeting the female students. So I think that's a, like official sexual discrimination. So the same question wouldn't be put to a man. Yeah. Right. Okay. Any other questions on the floor? Um, can I ask a question? Yeah. So we, we've had six and seven years now of um, Abenomics, and one of the uh, banner, the headlights of um, Abenomics has been womanomics. Uh, you know, rhetorically at least, the Abe government has made a lot of noise about increasing female participation in the workforce. And there, as I understand it, there are more women in the workforce. Yeah. The, the, the economy has pulled many in. Are we on the cusp of a, this is probably to the sociologists on the table, but are we on the cusp of a major um, upsurge in sort of not just female participation, but the fight back against sexism in the workforce, do you think? Well, I, was, there's so, well, I think there's some changes actually in the media. So media started to report sexual harassment cases more and more these days. And also there is a, you know, one incident about obvious discrimination against women at the entry, entrance exam of the medical, Tokyo Medical School. So I think there is a public awareness has been rising, raised uh, with respect to uh, preventing sexual harassment. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, government revised a law in June to strengthen uh, the anti-harassment, but still there's a lot of resistance coming from companies. So companies seem to be quite, you know, hesitant to, you know, to be held accountable. And there are lots of, you know, employees who abuse their power, but companies try to avoid that they are held account accountable. So there's no, you know, effective preventative measures yet. Um, and then government is quite uh, you know, f company friendly. So therefore, um, e even though government, well, Ministry of uh, and, uh, and the Cabinet Office or uh, other administrations put emphasis on the creating a society in which women shine, uh, they don't think that uh, harassment is necessary. I mean, anti harassment is necessary to actually realize uh, abenomics. So they think the harassment is another, it's a marginal issue, which is different from uh, abenomics or umanomics. I see. They always frame this issue as a, from the economic perspective mm -hmm. and not the gender perspective. And because they have emphasized this uh, umanomics, they have to concurrently mm -hmm. emphasize how important these gender issues is at the same time mm -hmm. in order to promote uh, the more participation in uh, mm -hmm. In uh, economic activities <coughs> by women, so uh, that's what we thought have been thinking. Mm -hmm. Right. Any other questions on the floor? Those are the woman at the back. Hi. Thank you very much for all of your comments. I actually have three questions for you, if I can do that. Mm -hmm. um, first of all. 
it, Do, can you identify sorry, yourself? My name is Vicky Bayer. I'm a professor at Hitotsubashi University and a freelance journalist. Um, first of all, I hear you to some degree saying that universities are, I don't want to say to blame, but have partial responsibility for this situation. And at the same time, you've mentioned that a big piece of this problem is the prevalence of these um, online apps that allow people to independently engage in job searches. So it, it seems to me that the people who are using these online apps are, in a way, trying to circumvent the traditional university sponsorship of job hunting mm -hmm. and engage in independent job searches. And I'm just wondering, in that case, why blame the universities for this problem? And um, really, if, if people are independently using these applications outside of the university system, what is it that a university can do in that case to actually keep students safe? And I'm wondering if you have perhaps developed some kind of proposal of concrete actions that you would suggest that universities undertake? And if so, could you share what some of those concrete actions might be? Mm -hmm. That's my first question. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, well, mm -hmm. concerning the concrete actions that should be taken by universities, um, we mentioned that um, universities should, well, first of all, they should conduct uh, an official survey on the state of sexual harassment while job hunting um, among students so they can realize that this is a, pro a problem. Um, and then um, we, we want universities to um, place, um, what do you call it, like uh, consultation services and sort of support centers where students can go and talk about the sexual harassment they received because right now there is um, no such system um, that I am aware of. Um, so we need to implement um, these consultation services where students can go talk to people, um, perhaps professionals, um, counselors, um, and sort of find ways that they can deal with this problem. Or perhaps um, find ways that they can um, sort of combat the, um, the company's um, sexual harassment problem. So um, those are two points that we mentioned. So at the moment, the surveys, the one that you quoted is a private magazine survey, right? Mm -hmm. The survey that you quote. And there are no other surveys? There's no other national survey on the extent of the problem? Not no, that no. We are as far as we know. No. So we demand universities and also the government to conduct survey. Yeah. Right. And also, uh, some, uh, I've heard that some university actually get a report uh, from female students and actually they negotiated with the company, the perpetrators' companies, and I get an official apology from the perpetrators. So that's some of the cases universities actually take action and protect <coughs> those students. So we are still discussing internally within, say, network, what kind of uh, concrete actions universities can take. So, but this particular case might be one of the examples that universities can do. But with respect to online application, as you said, this is really outside of a traditional the matching uh, 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 you know, way that universities usually do. Uh, so this is a really collective responsibility, I think. So universities and also Ministry of Labor and also k -Learning. So all those, and maybe Ministry of Education, those uh, stakeholders need to actually think about what to do. So we don't think that universities do bear the whole responsibility. But everybody's saying that we bear the just partial responsibility, and as a result, no one actually make any action. So we are calling for, this is a collective issue, so we have to actually sit together and discuss what can be done. And we are still uh, discussing and studying uh, what will be the concrete and also effective measures. And I think mm -hmm. at least the university can uh, unanimously make a statement mm -hmm. to combat against such a type of sexism towards students, because uh, universities nowadays introduce uh, more and more, the, for example, the internships, uh, and so they, ha they, they have the, uh, in their curriculums uh, also the internships and send students actually to the workplaces, and they have interactions with uh, 
people outside universities and the, some, some of the victims we have also heard are not only that uh, during the job hunting process but also during the internships and that has been also pro problematized uh, quite uh, for, 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 for well it, in the last years so I think uh, and also like uh, the te teachers internships uh, that's been always uh, mm. in the history of the uh, in the education uh, pedagogy then uh, they, they always introduce this internship so I think universities uh, could first uh, make a clear statement uh, that it is not acceptable to make use of this, uh, these opportunities and do some sexual harassment against students. That's the least they could do. But uh, I think because of this, uh, uh, they feel partially responsible or they, are not res they don't feel responsible uh, enough and they don't take any actions and we are now cons uh, considering how we can make them uh, aware of these p problems more because this is a very structurally uh, oriented. Yeah, and also... Right. Sorry, I'm sorry. just aware of the time here. We have four minutes left and you have oh. two questions. So yeah. um, try and get your second one out and we'll see how far we get you. Yeah? Okay. Well, my, my second one is that you've also mentioned that these apps, it, it seems that the people on the employer side using the apps are sometimes not actually representatives of the employer and they're sort of behaving independently mm -hmm. and possibly using mm -hmm. the app as an online mm -hmm. dating service. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you have any concrete ideas for uh, advice to companies on things that they can do to stop that sort of practice without actually harming people's job hunting experience. Um, Have you thought about that? Um, the apps introduced a system that can put like official mark like Twitter or Instagram, which companies has um, confirmed that they're the official workers, but still they don't put their names on it. And then still the rape incident is happening. So I don't exactly know for, like what they can do for, in, um, for those apps. Okay, but I was asking about the employer side companies. Any ideas for what those companies might mm -hmm. be able to do to make sure that we don't have these rogue job hunters mm -hmm. on the apps? Mm -hmm. Oh. Well, some, some companies actually ban using those applications. So that's one, I think, after the raping case was reported. So that's one thing that they can do. Well, they can give some accreditation to employees who can use that. Sorry, so, say that again. Accreditation system of employees who can use those uh, uh, app. So that could be, so students know that those employees are actually accredited, recognized by the companies as official recruiters. That's prevent maybe some of the, those who pretend that they have power. And finally, you mentioned that mm -hmm. this afternoon you have plans to present this to the mm -hmm. Ministry of Education. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you also have plans to take it to the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare? Uh, Ministry of Health and Labor already opened up the public comment. So those students uh, launched a campaign to solicit students to, to put lots of opinions to public comments. And we want the Ministry of Labor to reflect those opinions to revise the guideline. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for um, rushing to your last two questions. We have time for one more question, if anybody's got one. Chia, do you want to take the mic? and um, Just one, if that's all right. Thank you all for coming today. It's great to see an all-women panel. Uh, Chia Sorry. Matsumoto Freelance. Sorry, David. <laughs> I did my best. Well, you could, oh, no, I, one. <laughs> um, I was wondering if we have heard about sexual harassment cases mm. while job hunting, but has there, and then stu you said that students are often afraid that once you report it, then you might not get, they might not get the job. But has there been any cases that have been reported that maybe they were denied some job opportunities or not? Some students, um, we have read in our surveys that um, one student was told that if, um, it was a female student, if she does not agree to um, pursue a clerical position um, rather than a general career track position, then she will not be hired. So that was one case, yeah, that we heard. But actually, probably students don't actually report the sexual harassment case mm -hmm. and because they are afraid to be, you know, to be not fired, but that, to, to, that they are night day. 
will be denied. So we, we don't hear the case that actually someone reported and then they yeah. lost the job. We, we any, don't know the we, any we, pro, we, pro, protest, <coughs> protest uh, any hint of protest, mm -hmm. whether uh, about the sexual harassment or whether uh, the, uh, rejecting the clerical position, could they know that it caused definitely some negative impact. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, they always uh, put a break <laughs> on any kind of uh, uh, negative sp statements. So we don't really know whether there's that kind of uh, mm. actual uh, cases. Mm. So it is the fear, not necessarily. Yeah, yes, yes, yeah. it is more or less the fear. Yeah, this morning we hold a press conference in Japanese, and two other students also presented, but two of them actually dis didn't disclose their face or names. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they are, they are afraid that they might not get a job or they might lose their jobs. Yeah. And while my friend who has been victim of this harassment told me that she's she wants it to report, but like she was afraid that she would be personally attacked, like with like outside of the company, if he was fired. So that those fears are also <laughs> on them. Mm. Yeah. Right. Well, it's a very murky area, um, <clears throat> and the lack of. Um, a kind of national survey on the extent of the problem uh, it makes it ripe, I think, for an investigative journalist, right, to go and hunt around and see what's going on. So what we need is a good journalist to go and dig around and do a good story. Well, thanks so much for uh, for coming along, um, uh, Hash Sensei and um, uh, Miura Sensei, and of course, the, especially the two students. I know you were a bit nervous about talking, and uh, very bravely coming and not only giving your names, but your affiliation and talking um, very candidly about the problem. So thank you so much for that. And we do hope that you uh, get some traction on this. Do show your appreciation, please, for the, for the panelists. Thank you. I actually want to ask them one question. Sorry? I actually want to ask them one question. You want to ask the whole room one question? Um, I want to know like, how many of you have read this book about sexual, like, sexual harassment during Jim Panting? This is Zito-san, but yeah. we've had her at the FCCJ twice. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, like two out of Two, three, four, five, six, seven, <laughs> nine, seven, ten, eight. eleven, twelve. <laughs> two out of twelve. That's, that's great because in this morning we had a Japanese press conference and there were 30, almost, yeah, exactly 30 reporters who came there, and only three of them read this book. Although they're <laughs> reporters, and like they were put in a almost very similar situation, but they're not in reading this book. So I am so happy that they're a bit more percentage. What was the ratio of the Rinjin in Japan? Probably mostly. Only women, right? Oh, no, no, no. There three, two women, one. Two women. Then one. And also, uh, I was out of 30. Out of 30. <laughs> I don't think it's more women. Because that includes, women. I also wanted to ask like cameraman, the mm -hmm. camera guy, because I, because they were like obviously um, the ones working in media, so that mm -hmm. includes mm -hmm. non-journalist people too. Well, one of the reasons why she wrote the book was because she couldn't get any traction in the local media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why she wrote it, that's the way she explained it to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. The story wasn't picked up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.